Good morning, Bethany. It's good to be with you this morning. A warm welcome to those joining us online. My name is Lauren Seppi, and I work with our wilderness ministry here at Bethany. And I'm excited to continue with you all this morning as we dive deeper into God's word, as we're currently in a sermon series called New Ways to Be Human. And in this series, we're looking at the Sermon of the Mount, which is from the Gospel of Matthew, and exploring how Christ speaks about discipleship that is a journey. And this journey is one that invites us farther along a trail of love um, as we experience Christ transform our identities, our priorities, and our relationships. Um, So I'd love to read for us all this morning our scripture reading. It comes from Matthew 5, uh, first from verses 17 through 20, and then from verses 43 through 48. So hear now the word of the Lord. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And verse 43 continues, You have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Will you join me in prayer? Christ, thank you for your teaching um, that has for generations and generations inspired the church. Lord, this morning as we hear and spend time in your word, will you help us to hear it with fresh ears? Um, Christ, will you give us the words uh, that we need to hear and may we be inspired in our journey of discipleship as we long to follow you even closer and closer. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this time together this morning and we ask that you bless it. We love you and pray all these things in your name. Amen. So as some of you know, I have previously worked, um, had spent a season working as a mountaineering guide and I love to get outdoors. But this wasn't something that I necessarily grew up doing. It actually wasn't until I was a senior in high school that I went on my very first camping trip. And uh, when I moved to Seattle to go to college, uh, that was when I first got kind of a taste of what the outdoor scene is like. And it was during my first year at SPU that some of my friends and I decided that we wanted to go into the mountains and see what the hype was about. So I did some research online, looked at different trails. It was early spring, and my friends and I decided to go hike Bridal Veil Falls and Lake uh, Serene, which is right off of Highway 2. And I thought I knew what to expect. I had gone on Washington Trails Association and read about the trail. Uh, But unexpected to us, as we were hiking, we kept coming across big patches of snow. Um, It looked nothing like the pictures online, surprisingly. But eventually, as we were hiking along, we came to a particularly large patch of snow that was on a steep slope. And when we got there, we realized we have to turn around. Our instinct said, this isn't safe. You need to stop. Well, fast forward six years in my life. Um, I was no longer the college freshman doing some of my first hikes in Western Washington, uh, but I was actually spending a couple seasons working as a mountaineering guide. So there was a lot more snow in my future. Um, And throughout my time in the mountains, I learned so much. I learned all the different ways that you can walk on snow, kind of depending on what direction you're going. I learned how to read terrain so that I would know what route to take. Um, That would be the safest and the easiest. And all this time in the mountains guiding uh, shaped my instincts about how to be outdoors. And it led me to be able to try new and challenging outdoor adventures and to be able to more confidently navigate challenging terrain. And when we think about instincts, we often think about uh, instincts that are wired in our DNA, our instincts for survival or self-preservation, our instincts for social connection and so on. We all have those. 
And it's our instincts that guide how we act or respond in certain ways. It's our instincts that give us the tendencies um, for what we do. And for me with guiding, I now have more informed instincts uh, to be able to cross a snowfield safely or at least make a more informed decision about whether that's even doable or not. But instincts play out in all areas of our lives, and this is true in our life of faith. And while perhaps on the surface, the Sermon on the Mount can feel like God is speaking new and more intense rules for God's people, but as we're gonna explore today, Christ's invitation is actually to develop and shape our instincts. To develop and shape our instincts of what it means to be children of God in the world. So we're gonna look this morning at Christ's teaching in Matthew 5, verses 17 through 48, if you wanna follow along in your Bibles. And we're gonna consider how, as followers of Christ, we are invited to a journey of maturing in our faith. First, by allowing our instincts to be inspired by Christ. Second, by being brought into alignment with God's way in the world. And third, in being challenged to grow. So let's jump into our first point. As we think about how our instincts get shaped, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount pushes us to ask, where do we get our inspiration for what it means to be God's people? Said another way, who or what shapes our instincts to live out our faith? And there are multiple ways that our instincts are shaped and transformed, uh, but perhaps one of the most significant is that we are influenced by others. When I was a guide, I experienced this. I would go into the mountains with more seasoned guides and I would get to observe how they were, who they were in the mountains, how they navigated terrain, everything down to like what gear would they wear. And I learned so much, this was great. And it helped shape me to be a better guide because my instincts um, were able to navigate that. And this is true when it comes to our spiritual lives as well. Uh, here at Bethany, we often love writers and thinkers like Bonhoeffer and Brother Lawrence um, because their teaching and their lives inspire us in our own walks with Christ. And I know for many of us in the room, uh, we follow Christ because a leader or a family member or a friend went before us and showed us what that's like. And this is good. Christ speaks to us through other people and uses other people to shape and transform us. But there is a distinction, though. It's one thing to draw inspiration from another, uh, to look at their life as a model and example and be influenced and inspired by that. But it's another thing entirely to look at someone and idealize them and make them our measure for what it means to live out our faith. The Sermon on the Mount is our longest recorded teaching that we have of Jesus's, and throughout it, Jesus speaks to his disciples about what it means to follow God. And in Jesus' day and age, uh, that was often understood following God, was the law was their frame of reference. That's how they understood what it meant to follow God. And yet in his teaching that I just read, that beginning part of Matthew 5, um, Jesus highlights for his disciples two different sorts of people who they were using as models for what it meant to follow God. And those were those who don't take action seriously and those who are preoccupied with rigid rule following. So the first is those who don't take action seriously. Jesus says, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, in this, this passage, Christ isn't talking about those who don't know God or who are outside the faith. Like, of course, they don't know the law. But he's actually talking about family business. Like, this is a word for followers of Christ who already know these things. And these voices often, the ones who don't take action seriously, are those that embody this idea of faith without works. This plays out in a multitude of ways. We hear it in a lot of different messaging about whether that's grace without the need for messy, the messy work of repentance, or maybe it's the over-spiritualizing of faith that eventually like, it's just our inner lives that matter. Yet Jesus' words in this teaching show that this is not the response of discipleship. Our actions and our faith are connected to, our actions and behavior, sorry, are connected to our faith. 
Jesus, however, goes on to say more. And he says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And that brings us to the second model that the people had. Those who were preoccupied with literal rule following and often at the expense of relationship. And in Jesus' day and age, if there was anybody who was known for following the law and even extending it beyond what it was written, it was the scribes and the Pharisees. And some of us, we love rules. I am an eldest daughter in my family, and stereotypically, I am quite the rule follower. And this especially came to light for me uh, when I was in a season of life living in New Jersey, going to grad school with my husband. And while we were in New Jersey, we lived in an apartment. And the setting was really different than Seattle. We were in a small town. It was very quiet, hardly any traffic. Um, Maybe hard to imagine sometimes when we're from here. But to leave this apartment complex... You know, we'd get in our car, pull out of the parking spot, head to the end of the parking lot where we'd be stopped by a stop sign and then turn onto the road. And this road that you turn onto was never busy. And you had full visibility in both directions. You could always see if someone was coming. But usually someone wasn't coming. Anyways, whenever I would drive, I would always come to a full and complete stop at this stop sign. Because that's what you do at stop signs, right? Well, after living there for a little bit, and I was driving, my husband was in the car, and I again come to a full and complete stop at this stop sign. And Nathan says to me, he says, what are you doing? Why did you so completely stop? Like, there's nobody around. Uh, And that's when I discovered we have a slightly different driving philosophies. But Nathan, who is a safe driver, I will clarify, brought to light that not everybody stops at stop signs. Not everybody stops fully and completely at stop signs every time. But that doesn't mean that the same end isn't reached, right? Safe driving happens not because one stops fully at every single stop sign, but because there is a broader embodied mentality of safe driving. And again, this is not a perfect metaphor. I'm not endorsing that you run stop signs. Uh, That's not a like spirit of the law thing. But this does ask, help us ask the question, how do we relate to rules? And we have models like this in our Christian lives, voices that go really hard on the rules. People who say things like, you must, if you are Christian, you must vote for the specific, specific political party or the specific candidate. If you're Christian, you must raise your child in this way. You must do the spiritual practice. You must read these books by these authors. You must serve in this way. But in highlighting the reality that the scribes and the Pharisees were not, also not the examples to follow, Jesus reminds us that the rules themselves are not God. The law was meant to point to a deeper reality, one that reveals the presence in the heart of God. So again, Christ isn't saying that obeying the law isn't good or scriptural. We just heard how he rebuked folks that said following the law doesn't matter. But if we mistake following rules for being in relationship with God, then we are missing what the life of discipleship is. And this Sermon on the Mount, instead, encourages us to ultimately draw our inspiration from the character of God. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And note that he didn't say that he came to obey it or keep it, though he did do those things. But in fulfilling the law, Christ embodied the heart and the will of God for the world. It didn't mean that there were only spiritual concerns or that he came to check some boxes of morality. Thus, Christ teaches us that that we are to take our actions seriously because our faith is lived out in embodied ways. And he teaches that the fullness of our faith is not in checking off boxes, that the life of discipleship is one of knowing and living in alignment with God's heart. And that brings us to our second point this morning. This teaching in the Sermon of the Mount, Sermon on the Mount, invites us to align our lives and priorities with the heart of God. So after talking about one's relationship to the law we just looked at, Jesus jumps into specifics about the lives and the priorities of the disciples. And he does this by first looking at relationships. So broadly, the Sermon of the Mount 
touches on a lot of areas of our lives. We looked at it last week, uh, we're gonna talk about it next week in service. Things like our prayer lives, our relationship with money. Um, But it is notable that when Jesus first gets into specifics about our lives, that he talks about our relationships. God's heart is for relationship and it is rooted in love. In this section in Matthew 5, Christ addresses things like our anger, our lust, our struggles with faithfulness and with keeping our word, our desires for retaliation when we're hurt, and our tendencies to build barriers and to keep away from those who we dislike or consider enemies. And this section on the Sermon on the Mount is often called the antithesis, and that speaks to the sort of teaching uh, style that Jesus is using. So each of the teachings sets up these two contrasting things. The first is what is assumed by the disciples, and the second is the intensification of that principle. As Jesus repeats, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And just as he speaks about each one of these things, our anger, our lust, our brokenness, he brings to light the themes of healing, dignity, belonging, and faithfulness that we are being called into. And it is in that focus that we hear that the voice of God is one of love. And this is important because often when we hear what sound like rules, um, whether it's because of our upbringing or because we live in a country where our system of justice is retributive, it can be really easy for us to hear rules with the filter of shame. This voice that says, if you don't do this, then you are bad. Scott Erickson, who is an artist and a teacher, um, he's actually spoken here at Bethany before, he talks about in, how in religion, you often see two types of people. One who, when they hear the voice of God, they hear the voice of shame. And another who, when they hear the voice of God, they hear the voice of love. And it is often through how people uh, see God, read scripture, and treat other people that you know which voice they are hearing. And so while rules may bring up shame for some of us, the themes and the antitheses actually point to God's voice being one of love, one that speaks to and about us with love. And God's heart for love is perhaps most clearly seen in Jesus' command to love your enemies. Christ says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. Now this is certainly a familiar passage um, for most of us, and yet how often are our instincts to do exactly what Christ says not to do? How often are our instincts to just love our neighbor and to hate our enemies? As I've been pondering this passage for the past few weeks, it's been really easy to see in real time in our world the way that this plays out. Uh, We sure saw it this last week with the debate and the ongoing political commentaries. We sure see it in the ongoing violence between people, groups, in our world. And if we're honest, we sure see it even around our dining room tables, in our workplaces, in our social media interactions, and in our neighborhoods. Um, Man, have you ever been a part of a neighborhood Google group email chain? Um, I have, and uh, those have, that email chain, I have seen some of the most hateful long emails. Uh, one comes to mind that ended with, I'm contacting my lawyer. Um, and those were two literal neighbors. It is so much easier than we like to think to fall into hate. And it is so much easier than we like to think to justify that hate. And yet, Christ's command is to love our enemies. And this is not resignation or like passive action. This isn't throwing up your hands and avoiding those who you don't like. It's not even tolerating those who you don't see eye to eye with. No, Christ says to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. So as we consider our instincts, this call invites us to action instead of reaction. Christ is turning our gaze from avoiding what is bad and inviting us to discover God's will for our relationships in the world. But what does it mean to love? Since the word love is used in so many ways in um, our English language to describe a range of feelings and a range of actions, it's important to clarify this. 
Christ himself provides a really robust example of what love is. And he shows that love is not some soothing principle that makes everything fine. Uh, The Gospel of Matthew later goes on and talks about an interaction that Jesus has with the Pharisees and the scribes, folks who were known as being Jesus' enemies. And in this interaction, Christ shows that love actually can mean to challenge, to rebuke, to tell the truth, and so on. And Christ shows that love can be hard, but that it involves humanizing the other and wanting the best for them. And if we are gonna follow Christ, allow Christ to shape our instincts and align our lives with God's heart, we're gonna look different than those around us. We see it so clearly, the ways that people love their neighbor and hate their enemy. But the invitation is that we as Christ followers get to be marked by our instincts to radical love that transcends societal boundaries. And that brings us to our final point for this morning, that the Sermon on the Mount challenges us to grow in maturity. And perhaps this is not a surprise. If I were to reflect on my own life and the seasons that I experienced the most growth, usually those seasons were characterized by challenge. And I experienced this when my instincts were being shaped for hiking and guiding, um, because one of the most significant experiences I had in shaping that was uh, participating in a training with an organization, and we called the training 10 Day. This was 10 days of going into the mountains, getting to practice all your skills and getting a feel for it. And my first 10 day was so hard. We had terrible weather. I have memories of sideways rain, thick fog, blowing wind as I'm practicing crevasse rescues on a glacier up in the mountains. Like it, a lot of us would have described the experience as miserable. That was the coldest and wettest I've ever been. But when we got back to camp, um, after being in the mountains for that time, and we were all dry and warm, um, me and my fellow guides learned that our camp director had actually been praying that it would be a hard trip. That he had uh, been praying that there would be bad weather and that it would be challenging. Because nothing quite prepares you for guiding like doing it first in the hardest conditions. Your instincts for safety, comfort, asking for help, all get shaped and transformed when you're in difficult environments. So while challenging may not be surprising that that's part of walking the trail of love, it's usually not desired. Broadly speaking, we as a society are becoming less and less interested in challenge. Uh, Earlier this month, David Brooks had an op-ed in the New York Times called The Junkification of American Life, And essentially, he noted a trend about how across American life, while we have a lot of wonderful things, we more and more are settling for junky things, for cheap distractions and quick and easy rewards. And in the article, he uses an example of uh, us choosing to scroll videos on social media as our form of entertainment, instead of choosing to engage with art, like reading a literary novel or watching a serious drama. And this is so much so to the point that the art and entertainment industries are struggling because people are choosing the quick gratification and stimulation and distraction. And I experienced this myself. I noticed it a couple weeks ago when I was on vacation. I couldn't believe how many times I caught myself opening the Gmail app on my phone. My instincts in a down moment were to check my email. Even though I was on vacation, I had no plans to email anyone back. My vacation reminder was on. So why did I keep doing it? And there are so many of these behaviors. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's the checking the news constantly, scrolling social media, video games, food, so many that lead us on that easy route. But again, God is not speaking to us with the voice of shame. It is really understandable that we are vulnerable to these things when our lives feel busy and tiring and anxiety producing. But the voice of love doesn't leave us there. In light of this reality that life is hard, it's also understandable that the way of love that the Sermon of the Mount calls us to also feels hard. Our passage today ends with Christ saying, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And that when we hear Christ speak about our relationships and what our instincts should be when it comes to our anger and our lust and our brokenness and so on, that this challenge to be perfect feels daunting, overwhelming, if not impossible. 
In speaking about Jesus' words on enemy love, one commentator I read said that loving enemies is a way of living in expectation of miracles. That loving enemies is a way of living in expectation of miracles. And I think this could be true about any of the things Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. It is so challenging that to live this way, we must expect miracles. And there's a lot of weight placed on the word perfect in our context. Um, And perfect for us usually holds connotations of the spotlessness or of like being beyond improvement. The Greek word, however, teleos, which is the word where we get this translation perfect from, holds more connotations though of completeness or wholeness. It's less about spotlessness and more about wholeness. And throughout the New Testament, teleos is used to speak about spiritual maturity. So when Jesus speaks about perfection in the Sermon on the Mount, he is sharing that there is no limit to living in alignment with God's heart. Because in theory, a definable set of rules could be fully kept. But the demands of being children of God, living in alignment with God's heart, that takes a lifetime. That work is never done. But thankfully, we don't have to do this challenging work alone. The Sermon on the Mount was not a teaching that Jesus gave to an individual in private telling like, this is how you should live your life. But it was actually given to a community of disciples. All of them were there as Jesus was teaching. Being inspired by Christ's character and living in alignment with God's heart is not a challenge that we have to do on our own. We get to do it together. And throughout his life and teaching, Christ continually challenged those who met and followed him we can expect challenge on the trail of love and the journey of discipleship. And the Gospel of John recounts a story actually where Jesus gives a teaching about eternal life, sharing that he is the way. And a lot of folks find that to be a really difficult teaching. So much so that John writes in his Gospel that many of Jesus' disciples turned back and no longer went with him. And they, after they left, Jesus turns to the 12 disciples who are with him and he says, do you also wish to go away? But Peter responds, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. The shaping of our instincts to look more and more like Christ will be challenging. But just as Peter reminds us, the work is life-giving and life-affirming, and it is the journey. So the Sermon on the Mount invites us to the lifelong journey of maturing in faith. And it has a word for us no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what season you're in, and no matter how long you've been following Christ. And the journey is one of our instincts being shaped. To be more loving, to discern God's will, to be more and more inspired to look like Christ, and to let these instincts play out in our relationships with our partners, with our families, with our coworkers, with our neighbors, with our enemies. And while this journey will have its challenges, Christ reminds us that we travel it with others and we get to trust in the voice of love that guides us. Will you join me in prayer? Christ, thank you for the ways that you show us and teach us and speak to us about what it means to follow you and what it means to live the good life. Lord, we're grateful for your ongoing presence in the midst of doubts and challenges that you know we meet along the way. Christ, this morning we ask that you bring to mind for us, um, whether that be relationships or places in our lives, Lord, where you are challenging our instincts and inviting us to step into alignment with your heart. Um, Will you reveal those to us, Lord, and invite us deeper um, and closer to you? We thank you for your heart of love and your voice of love that speaks to us. Um, And we ask that you help us hear it as we go forward. We love you, Christ, and we pray all these things in your name. Amen.